Welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be exploring a case which has been suggested to me several times, and that like the rest of the country, bothered me when I first heard about it. The disappearance of 24-year-old Rebecca Corium from the Disney cruise ship that she was working on caused a huge amount of confusion and speculation, and to this day causes her family unimaginable pain as she is still not being found, and her disappearance remains unanswered. I have used the website set up by Rebecca's family, as well as other sources in this episode, and they will be linked in the show notes. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Rebecca Corium was born on the 11th of March 1987 at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the city of Chester. Chester is a city in the northwest of England and is known for its extensive Roman walls. It's also known for its many Tudor-style buildings. It's a tourist hotspot and many people travel to it each year to spend time learning about its history. Rebecca grew up in the city with her parents, Anne and Mike, and her sister, Rachel. From an early age, Rebecca was a happy and friendly person who liked to be known as Bex. She enjoyed being active and loved anything that involved sports. She would often be found running, cycling or playing basketball and loved to get involved with outdoor pursuits, including taking part in triathlons and runs. During her teenage years, she joined the cadets and volunteered for them working as part of their camping and manoeuvres events. It was clear to Rebecca's family and friends that she also had a very good idea of what she wanted to do with her life and in her career. After leaving sixth form, she attended Plymouth University to study sports science. She also graduated from Liverpool Hope University, where she studied childhood studies in youth philosophy and psychology. Rebecca worked hard, and when she was back at home, she also took on other jobs, such as working at Chester Zoo like her grandparents had done, and working with her sister at the Doubletree by Hilton Hotel in the city. As Rebecca grew up, she also had other aspirations, and that was to see the world. Like many other young people who had left university, she was interested in taking part in Camp America. Camp America hires people from around the world to work at their summer camps located across the country, and aims to find people who have different skill sets. Rebecca was hired to work at one of their camps in Maine, and worked teaching sports activities for four months. Rebecca's parents spoke to her regularly while she was in America, and she enjoyed experiencing something new. Having enjoyed this experience, Rebecca decided to apply for an even more permanent job abroad in 2010. She travelled down to London for an interview with Disney Cruise Line, which was a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company and had been going since 1996. The competition for jobs was fierce, with hundreds of people being interviewed. Rebecca, however, was successful and got a job with Disney in June 2010. She attended training in Florida before setting off on her first cruise working in the youth activities team. On her first contract, Rebecca visited different ports on the way to the Bahamas and spent four months on board before returning home for two months before her next cruise. Rebecca's parents remember this as a happy time where they got to spend some time with her and she went out shopping with friends. Rebecca's next job was going to be aboard the Disney Wonder, which was sailing from Los Angeles to Mexico. Rebecca travelled out as expected and did one trip on the cruise before sadly having to return home for two weeks to attend her grandfather's funeral. Rebecca's journey to the airport to fly back to America was eventful, with her plane having to return back to Manchester before an unscheduled landing in Dublin, and then eventually making it across the Atlantic. Rebecca's parents remember that she found the whole thing funny, and this was just what Rebecca was like. In the early months of 2011, she arrived safely back on the ship, and for the next six weeks everything appeared to be as it usually was. Rebecca continued to keep in contact with her parents, which she usually did either on Facebook or by using Skype. On March 21st, the ship once again left LA on its next trip, and Rebecca sent a message to her parents explaining that she was going to ring them the next day. She never made this call to her parents, and they were immediately concerned about why. 
It's reported that on board the Disney Wonder on the 22nd of March, Rebecca had not turned up for her shift at 9am. This was unusual and it wasn't like her to be late. Staff used the ship's PA system to tannoy a message to her, however she still did not turn up. Her room was also checked, but she was not in it, and it became apparent that she had not been seen that morning. This sparked a full search of the ship looking for Rebecca, but yet again she could not be located. Concern began to grow as if she wasn't on the ship, then there was the possibility that she had somehow ended up in the water. It's reported in an article by the Bahamas Weekly that the Mexican Navy and the US Coast Guard were brought in to search the waters around the ship. This was a huge undertaking, as the ship had been moving continually throughout the night, and the waters on this entire route had to be checked to see if they could find Rebecca. Nothing, however, was found in the water, and she was not located. The issue that they had was that they didn't know when Rebecca had gone missing and from where and so staff attempted to narrow down the window by checking CCTV. The Disney Wonder had extensive CCTV, and this was checked for any sign of her. Fortunately, the cameras had picked up one sighting of Rebecca on the morning of the 22nd of March, just a few hours before her shift was due to start. Rebecca was spotted using an internal phone in the crew quarters. The one thing that stood out when looking at the CCTV was that she appeared upset. There is no sound on the video, but a man can be seen approaching her, and it's clear that he asks her if she's okay. She then appears to reply, yeah, fine. Rebecca is then seen putting the phone down and putting her hands in her back pockets. She then puts her hands to her head and pushes her hair back away from her face. She walks off and disappears off the footage. It was evident that Rebecca had been upset about something while she was on the phone and that she then disappears off the ship in the next three hours before the alarm is raised. Rebecca's parents are later shown the footage and told the Guardian newspaper that although she did appear upset, her gestures were normal for her and they had seen her doing them lots of times. Despite searching the ship and the waters around it, they were none the wiser about what happened to Rebecca that morning. It was decided that a detective from the Bahamas Maritime Authority would come out to the ship to investigate Rebecca's disappearance. Despite the fact that the Bahamas was around 1,500 miles away from the ship at that point, the investigation technically fell under their jurisdiction. This was because the Disney Wonder was registered in the Bahamas for tax reasons, therefore it was their force that were asked to come to look into it. The situation on cruise ships is notoriously complicated and Rebecca's particular circumstances are reported in John Ronson's article for The Guardian in 2011. He states, It wasn't deemed relevant that it's based in Los Angeles, the head companies in the UK, Rebecca was a British citizen, and that she went missing in international waters between the US and Mexico. For European passengers, this holds true for all cruise liners but a law passed last year that means if a US citizen disappears on a cruise ship, the FBI has jurisdiction. Just one detective was sent out to the ship, and Rebecca's parents were notified about her disappearance. The news was horrific for Anne and Mike, who couldn't believe that she could have just disappeared. Rebecca's mum, Anne, told the BBC at the time, We can't come to terms with it. Where is Rebecca? We don't know whether she's dead or alive. We're hoping that she's such a good swimmer she might have gone overboard and swam to the coastline and somebody may have taken her in. Rebecca's parents were not sure what they were going to discover when they travelled out to LA on the 25th of March to meet the ship and hear about the investigation. Their parents later told the Guardian newspaper that they were disappointed by what they discovered when they arrived. They found that only one detective had been assigned to the case and that he had only spent one day aboard the ship conducting interviews. It was also discovered that he had interviewed some of the crew members and none of the passengers. A report by the BBC would later state that only six people were spoken to about Rebecca's disappearance. Disney issued a statement to the BBC on the 28th of March explaining that they had been in close contact with the Corium family and searched extensively for Rebecca. They stated, We have been doing everything possible to find Rebecca Corium, 
including conducting multiple shipboard searches, the latest one as recently as Saturday. In addition, we have been working with all of the appropriate authorities. Rebecca's disappearance has been difficult for everyone at Disney Cruise Line. We've been in contact with the Corian family and we're assisting them in any way we can. The truth was, this was the first time that anybody had gone missing on a Disney cruise ship and Rebecca's disappearance was hitting the headlines internationally. Despite the searches that were conducted, they had not located Rebecca and thoughts of what may have happened to her continued to be speculated upon. As the UK authorities were unable to assist in the investigation, the family had to wait for the Bahamas Maritime Authority to conclude what may have occurred. Paul Roll, the detective tasked with the investigation, eventually concluded that Rebecca must have fallen overboard and that her disappearance was not deemed as suspicious. Disney also appeared to agree with this as they explained they'd found a flip-flop on the deck that they believed belonged to Rebecca and suggested that the conclusion she had gone overboard was correct. There were lots of unanswered questions, however. How had she gone overboard? Where had she been on the ship? Why had she not been spotted elsewhere on CCTV that morning? And had the phone call got anything to do with what happened to her? The lack of other evidence and information gave rise to even more speculation and concern. In October 2011, journalist John Ronson took a trip on the Disney Wonder, travelling the same route as Rebecca had taken while working there. He had been in contact with Rebecca's parents, who agreed that he should take the route and while he was there, try and speak to some of the staff members about what they remember about Rebecca, or the night she disappeared. His findings were documented in an article in The Guardian in November 2011. Staff on board the Disney Wonder were mostly complimentary about working on board, saying that they get good crew quarters with their own entertainment and get to go ashore. They told Ronson that Disney aren't slave masters and that everyone was happy and smiley people, and that's why they were hired. They explained that Rebecca was like that too. When asked why that had happened to her, they said, I don't know, but there's nothing dark and sinister going on. This is Disney. One of the staff members, when asked about what they believed happened to her, answered very certainly that she went overboard after falling off crew deck 5 close to the staff pool. He said he was on the ship that day and that everyone knows what happened because they found her flip-flop. Ronson describes that he went to deck 4 as there was a jogging deck there and it was thought that she might have been going for a run. One of the staff members told him that it was on crew deck 5 that it was believed she had gone overboard and her shoe was found. When Ronson went to look down at deck 5 and the crew pool, he noticed that there were steel railings around it and that they were above head height. Despite the certainty that many of the staff members had about what happened to Rebecca, there were some who cast some doubt that this may not have been the case. One question mark about the whole situation was the phone call that Rebecca was seen having that morning. One staff member told Ronson that these phone calls are recorded and that Disney would have it. He was also put in touch with one of Rebecca's friends on the ship that told him that she had been having a bit of a fight with her partner at the time and that may have explained why she was upset that morning. Rebecca had been in a relationship with a woman named Tracy Medley, who also worked on the ship. Ronson returned home and was put in touch with another of Rebecca's friends who had worked on the ship. She explained that Rebecca was a bouncy and happy person who loved life. She said that she had last seen her at 11pm on the night of the 21st of March and that she was her usual self. Rebecca's friend confirms that she was in a relationship and that it was quite an intense one as she describes them both as fiery and passionate personalities. She explained that she wouldn't rule out that that may have been why she was upset that morning as there were problems in the relationship. However, she did state that she was under the impression that Rebecca was talking to a mutual friend that morning, not her partner. Her friend went on to tell Ronson about an odd thing that happened after Rebecca went missing. She explained that Disney staff placed some flowers on Crew Deck 5 at the location that she allegedly went overboard. She stated that no one explained why they had put them there and would not answer any questions about it. 
She acknowledged that the ship was full of rumours, but confirmed she did not believe that the flip-flops that had been found were Rebecca's at all. She said they were too big and were pink and Hawaiian and not her style. This is something also corroborated by Rebecca's family. She also questioned why Disney did not try and confirm anything with the people who knew her. She stated, Why didn't Disney come to me or her girlfriend and say, Can you identify these as Bex's? Instead they put them in her room for when her parents got on board. Who does that? Disney swear they have told us everything they know, which is they don't know anything. But most of us think it's bullshit. Someone must know something. Someone's covering something up. When the friend was asked about why they would do that, she stated, to try and protect the brand. If it was 6am and they were doing their job and watching the front, someone must have seen her go over. Or if they didn't, they're covering up why they didn't. She also added that they owe it to Rebecca to find out what happened to her. The odd details such as the flip-flops that didn't seem to belong to her and the fact that none of the many CCTV cameras picked up Rebecca again, let alone spotted her falling overboard, made some believe that Disney were not divulging everything they knew about that morning. The information that Rebecca had also been in quite an intense relationship may have explained her demeanour that day. Although, even the phone call is shrouded in some mystery as we don't know what the call contained. Rebecca's family continued to campaign for their daughter and tried to drum up as much support for her as they could. In April, they released 500 balloons at Chester Racecourse to remember Rebecca, and 300 people were in attendance. The family must have felt helpless as they were unable to influence the investigation from the UK, and UK authorities were unable to get involved. The family were sure that not enough had been done to try and find their daughter and were critical of the investigation. In 2014, it was reported that Mike and Anne were suing Disney for $75,000. The basis of this lawsuit was that they had failed in their duty of care. It's reported in a BBC article from 2014 that the lawsuit claimed that they acted negligently by waiting too long to notify the Coast Guard and the police in the Bahamas. They gave false and misleading information about the ship's position to the Coast Guard, their security on board to monitor staff and passengers was inadequate, and failed to follow the correct protocols when someone had gone overboard. A spokeswoman for Disney issued a statement in response, saying, This incident has been investigated by the authorities. The claims are without merit, as will demonstrate in court. It is reported in Cheshire Live that the family reached a settlement with Disney, which also included a non-disclosure agreement. Despite this, the family continued to fight for a UK inquiry into Rebecca's disappearance. They hired a private investigator called Bill Anderson to look more closely into the case. He reported to the BBC programme Inside Out that he is convinced that something criminal happened to Rebecca. On the same programme, Labour MP for Chester, Chris Matheson, also discussed his own feelings about the case after speaking to Anderson and reviewing the original police reports. His feelings are documented in an article by the Liverpool Echo in 2015. He stated, I believe there is sufficient evidence to indicate that a crime may well have taken place. It's a possibility and it needs to be investigated properly. The more you look into it, the more it smells rotten the more it smells that a crime has taken place. There seems to be an attitude that nobody wants to take responsibility. Nobody really wants to get to the bottom of this, they just want it to go away. It hasn't been properly investigated yet, and now is the time for that investigation to take place. He reportedly described the evidence as compelling, but said for legal reasons he could not divulge why this was. The family were also supported by former Deputy Prime Minister Lord John Prescott, who had experience as a former ship steward. He campaigned for a change to maritime laws that allow investigations to take place in the country that the ships registered in, as in Rebecca's case. He stated, I have been in Parliament for 40 years, and I have been ever concerned after 10 years at sea to end this flags of convenience situation where ship owners register in certain countries where they are lax in their law on safety and make better tax arrangements. It's individuals like Rebecca who suffer when they go missing. He added, 
is the conspiracy of silence to do nothing. Whatever the circumstances are, there's an obligation to investigate. The campaign to get a UK-led investigation into Rebecca's disappearance continued, and it seemed that people did agree that something further needed to be done to find out what happened. In 2017, Rebecca was once again in the headlines. However, this time it was due to someone coming forward to talk about her. Tracy Medley was Rebecca's girlfriend at the time that she disappeared and had not spoken to the media since 2011. When she did come forward, what she had to say was rather shocking. She explained that Rebecca was not the happy, relaxed person that she had been made out to be and actually was a troubled person who had taken drugs in the past. Medley stated that Rebecca didn't always feel that her sexuality was accepted and struggled with this. She also told the newspapers that she had talked about jumping off the ship before, and she believed that she did commit suicide. This was in direct contrast to the many other people who knew her, including her family and friends, who had never seen this side of Rebecca. There were some questions about why Medley was coming forward with this information six years after the disappearance. It emerged that Medley also had a boyfriend on the ship at the same time that she was having a relationship with Rebecca, and she stated that the three of them had been together until the early hours of that morning. This was also new information, and made people consider what may have happened in those early morning hours, considering Rebecca had been so distressed at 5.45am. When confronted about why it had taken six years to come forward, Medley said that she was protecting the image of a friend. Many of the tabloid newspapers in the UK ran with headlines about Rebecca taking drugs and committing suicide. This was no doubt distressing for her family, and not helpful to their campaign to get her disappearance reinvestigated. Medley's account was in direct contrast with what her family and other friends on the ship knew and it did not seem to make sense to them. Unfortunately, the sad reality is, Rebecca is not the only person to have vanished off a cruise ship. Since 2000, over 200 people have disappeared from cruise ships, with the number probably being closer to 300, according to some sources. This issue sadly affects people around the world, as their loved ones simply do not return home. 63-year-old John Halford went missing just a few weeks after Rebecca, after he boarded the ship Thompson Spirit for a week's holiday to Egypt. He had gone alone, and his wife Ruth was due to pick him up at the airport when he returned. He rang her the day before he was due to return home to say he would see her at the airport the next day. He was then seen at 12.30am drinking cocktails on the upper deck bar. It's reported in the Daily Mail that Ruth was contacted the next day by the Thompson desk at the airport. She stated, I was told the plane was in the air, but my husband was not on it. He'd gone missing from the ship. You could have knocked me over sideways. It made no sense. The children and I were shell-shocked. At first, I thought he must have gone ashore without anyone realising, but it would have been impossible because there were various checkpoints when you disembark. He simply disappeared. John Halford had left his wallet and passport behind, and police concluded that he had either jumped or fallen overboard. Ruth would later discover that he had packed his suitcase ready to leave the next day, and when this was returned to the family, they found souvenirs that John had bought for them. She believes that his intention was to return home to them. She told the Daily Mail that she felt let down by Thompson. Thompson haven't given me any support either. John was in their care, but I haven't had so much as a letter from them. A judge declared a presumption of death certificate in his case in 2018, as it was assumed that he had died in Egypt. Sadly, this is an all-too-familiar story for the families of missing people from ships, and there is very rarely a conclusive answer to what happened to them. Like many other families of the missing, Rebecca's family remained dedicated to finding out what happened to their daughter. They continued to campaign for a UK inquiry into her disappearance and set up a website to tell people about Rebecca and her story. Just this year, Channel 4 broadcast a programme called Nightmare Cruises, Going Overboard, and Rebecca's story was featured on that. It was reported that former Met detective Roy Ram had been looking into the case on behalf of the family. 
he explained on the show. The really troubling thing is that we don't know everything that happened on that ship because there has been no inquest. All kinds of explanations have been given about what happened, but none of them make any sense. I think this sums up the case when trying to figure out what happened to Rebecca. There is a distinct lack of information about anything that happened that night and early morning. This may be because the investigation took place on the ship and was not shared immediately with the family. The fact that the investigation was done by authorities in the Bahamas and not here in the UK means that the information has not been shared as widely as it might have been. This has certainly hindered the investigation and has meant that the family feel uninformed about the situation and upset that nothing more appears to have been done to find Rebecca. The information that was provided was also confusing as there were multiple snippets of evidence that don't make much sense. Rebecca was described by the majority of people that knew her on the ship as happy, however the only piece of evidence that night was the CCTV that showed that she was distressed. That points to something happening that night that is still unknown. What had upset her and why? The lack of further CCTV evidence on the ship does not help, and her family are left wondering where she went afterwards. It's indicated that she must have gone to the crew pool and jumped from there, as her flip-flops were later found. However, this is not conclusive, as it's disputed that the flip-flops were even hers, and that they weren't the correct style or size. There is also the information that she was with her partner in the hours before her disappearance, but we don't know the circumstances surrounding that either. In any other investigation, a timeline could be put together using known evidence to at least point to a theory, but in this case, the evidence is just not there to do this. Because of that, this leads people to speculate and theorise about what happened without being able to consult facts. I think it's crucial to look at what we know. We know Rebecca was in good spirits at around 11pm the night before as she spent time with her friend in the crew quarters. We know that she was next seen distressed and on the internal crew phone at 5.45am. We know that she didn't show up for her shift at 9am. An investigation was later conducted that lasted one day and spoke to some of the staff members and none of the passengers. A search of the waters around the ship was conducted, but nothing and no sign of Rebecca was ever found. Did Rebecca go overboard at some point in those few hours? Was it a tragic accident? Did she jump? Or was it something more sinister? As the family point out, there has been no official investigation to rule any of these theories out, and this is what they continue to campaign for, as do many other families of people who have gone missing on cruise ships. There seems to be a unanimous feeling that more could be done in these situations to look for missing people, or at least investigate their cases more thoroughly. I agree that perhaps something does need to change to help these families who feel completely helpless when their loved ones go missing in foreign waters. If you have any information about Rebecca's disappearance, or just want to read more about what her family is campaigning for, please visit www.rebecca-corium.com. This is such a tragic case and an important campaign. The link will also be in the show notes. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I would love to hear your thoughts about this one, so please let me know. I want to thank, as always, our Patreon supporters for continuing to support the podcast every week. If you want to receive stickers, shoutouts, bonus episodes, and ad-free early access, go and have a look at the link, it's in the show notes. Also, thank you to everyone that rates and reviews the podcast. Thank you to Mush776 this week for your five-star review. It really does help. You can also help to support us by visiting the podcast's YouTube channel and subscribing. I upload the audio from episodes and it just helps get these cases even more coverage. If you want to connect with me on social media, you can on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. You can also send any suggestions for cases to my email at theunseenpod at gmail.com. Stay tuned until the end today for a promo from Sublime True Crime, which is a podcast hosted by Dan and Elaine from the wonderful northwest of England. I'm not biased, I promise. Have a listen. Once again, thanks for listening, and as always, I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen.
I'm Dane. I'm Elaine. And we host the Sublime True Crime Podcast. With a new episode every Sunday, we're possibly the only podcast where one of the co-hosts can't pronounce the name of their own show. Oh, but you do try. Yes, I wonder who that could be. (laughs) We concentrate on UK crimes of all kinds. Murder, rape, serial killers. We've even covered the world's largest mugging recently. Although my favourite is still the Hatton Garden heist. That was a really good episode. I really enjoyed that one. Mm. All of the crimes we cover are solved cases, barring the first episode where, in fairness, we were finding our feet. Is that the one where you didn't realise it was unsolved until you'd written most of the episode and then didn't want to waste it? Maybe. We are currently (laughs) completely ad-free and we've just finished our first season. We'd love for you to come and listen to us. Just search for Sublime True Crime on any good podcast provider. Click subscribe and listen to the back catalogue of 15 existing episodes. We hope you'll join us soon. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.